This is my grandma's robe. She sewed it herself. I remember her always wearing this, cooking all day, nagging us to have a nosh or put sockies on our fitzalas or sewing us thick, warm jackets so we wouldn't catch a cold. But she was so much more than that. When I looked past Grandma in the robe, I discovered Hannah, the woman and friend to guide me through my own life. Hannah was a survivor of unspeakable trauma. I became a survivor of trauma too, but I also became a survivor of her memory. All of you here, all of us here, we've lost people and we are survivors of that loss. But through tears and grief disguised as a burden, we can transform that loss into an enduring living mission. Today I want to explain how I did that. There were three surprises or three shocks that inspired me to look deeper. The first was a surprise party I made for my grandma when I was 13. We had a health project and our assignment was to do a good deed for someone else and write about the impact. So I thought of my grandma's famous saying, you must celebrate when the times are good. As a kid, I thought that meant cookies, cakes, and parties. So as a 13-year-old, I decided to throw a surprise birthday party for my grandma. I called every relative I knew and every neighbor on my block. Tana Stochel was everyone's grandma. 20 friends and family lined up around our kitchen table with a feast, waiting for my mom to bring my grandma in the front door. I couldn't wait to see the look on her face. All right, everyone. One, two, happy birthday to Emil. I'm I'm sorry. I I cannot. I stood in really close to her tiny brown eyes, and I zoomed in on a tear. My friends, I I, I feel bad that. My friends aren't here to celebrate with me. They all died in the war, and I ask God, why me? Why am I still alive? We stood there watching her cry that she didn't deserve this. And so I started to wonder, who was Hannah Stochel before I was born? And who were all these friends that made her feel like she didn't deserve to celebrate her birthday? So I began trying to reweave Hannah's life. I started by asking those friends and family, and I gathered enough for her basic story. My grandmother, at 18 years old, was really Hannah Shackney, Blonde, brown-eyed, and living in Czechoslovakia. Here she is with most of her family. She had just married her first love. Then she was taken to the death camps of Auschwitz. Luckily, she was an excellent seamstress, and she survived because Nazis forced her to sew their uniforms. When the camps were finally liberated, a soldier told my grandma, you're free, and she didn't know what that meant. Hannah eventually found most of her family, and they mistook her for a ghost, not believing she had made it through the Holocaust. She had survived, but found out that her husband and oldest brother had not. Hannah and her remaining seven siblings, yes, another baby was born when the rest of the family hid in the woods, they came to America on a boat. And that trip left her with a mysterious fear of water for the rest of her life. 
it was here in America that she met Irving Stochel, an ex-resistance worker from Poland and now an immigrant tailor on Delancey Street. They fell in love, married, and established a successful garment factory. And they were sewing for the biggest celebrities and department stores of the day, created a family, and were living the American dream. But not really. There was more trauma in store. My grandma always longed for her first husband. She was molested by her dentist shortly after the war. She had terrible toxemia, nearly died giving birth, and almost died from an abortion. And here, she was an immigrant. People threw shoes at her because she was different. Life in America was not easy for my grandma. Yes, she was strong, but she had her secrets too. The more I learned about my grandma's story, the more amazing that resolution became to celebrate when the times are good after so much suffering. As one relative told me, she was a happy woman when the memories didn't get in her way. The second shock came as Grandma helped us prepare for our Passover Seder in 2005. I was 18 years old, the same age as my grandma when she was taken to the concentration camps. At this point, I also had some secrets. Like my grandma, I had been molested by someone in a position of authority. And I now wanted to know more from Grandma herself. I never got the opportunity. That night, our celebration surprised me with a stomach ache that sent me right up to my room and then to the emergency room where a blood clot had formed in the main abdominal artery, causing my intestines to become gangrene and my stomach to literally explode. My grandparents were sent home in a cab. This is a picture of that Passover night. It's the last picture of my life before that blood clot changed everything. I spent months in a coma, and when I finally woke up, I wanted my Passover back and my grandma's comfort. But the third shock, grief, like a finished thread. This would be the last picture I'd ever have with my grandma because while I was fighting for my own survival, close to death myself, both my grandparents had died. When I finally woke up, they were gone along with months of my life. <laughs> I wanted to know how I was to survive the dozens of surgeries ahead for me and years being unable to eat or drink anything by mouth. And I wondered even more how my grandmother had survived after her life had been so torn apart. Could I, as her granddaughter, do the same? To answer these questions, I started a lengthy yet ultimately life-changing process of still asking more questions. First, I asked the people around me, family and friends. Mom said grandma never liked talking about her past. An uncle told me, you just didn't ask that generation. Another told me, everyone knows a tiny bit of something and a lot of bit of nothing. Still, I listened to each tiny unfinished thread, recorded everything, and soon I could weave together the story that I shared with you. Second, I researched online. I searched for dates, records, Holocaust timelines, life in Brooklyn for immigrants after the war, I watched documentaries, contacted libraries, searched through archives for newspapers from that time. Uh, two of the many things I found, 
This is a record of Hannah's US residency. And this is a record of the transport to the death camp. These kinds of facts help jog the memory of those who knew my grandma. For example, finding the old address of a Brooklyn diner where my mom grew up was what made her remember the shoes being thrown at my grandma. Finding more information on grandma's sewing business led to stories about what working in the factory was like for her. Every hard fact unraveled more of Hannah's threads and we're slowly turning the fear of losing my grandma into the joy of preserving her story. A third, I embraced oral history and sought out people outside my circle and recorded their memories. I tracked down three generations of relatives in seven different countries. Facebook helped me with that. <laughs> I conducted hours of interviews and transcribed hundreds of pages. I dug for history and came up with something even more valuable, memory. I found my great uncle Morris, Hannah's younger brother, through Facebook. And I was told that he couldn't tell me anything. All he does is play bridge in Florida. But I was patient and persistent knowing that our bodies store things that we might not think we remember. So at first, all Morris told me was this. Hi, Amy, I don't remember much, just her delicious lemon bars, which still make me drool. She was a great baker, sewer, and I owe her for my wonderful fashion tastes. She was the family's right arm. But the more he started talking about her lemon bars, he started talking about my grandma's first husband and then watching their older brother being taken to the death camps after shouting, take me instead to save the rest of his family. He also recalled how my grandma had risked her own life every night in the holding camps to sew extra fabric for her younger sister. In these untold stories, I found the strength that I had been seeking all along and the lessons I needed to learn from my grandma. I kept at it. Maura sent me hours of voicemails and I typed up 300 pages of stories from the man who didn't remember anything. <laughs> Morris also told me, Amy, your grandmother always loved me and made me feel important. She gave me the confidence that I've always had. I knew that grandma had given me that confidence too. And I too could change my darkness to light. I learned what true resilience was and, and that it was a part of me, not only to survive my trauma, 28 surgeries, six years being unable to eat or drink anything by mouth, a divorce, and most recently, broken legs in a car accident, but still to celebrate now when the times are good. <laughs> My grandmother picked up pieces of her new world and she created a life tapestry much different than the one she hoped to live but still very beautiful. These three steps, talking to people, researching and recording oral memories, help me recover my grandma and help the survivors in my own family find their own strength as they started to remember their own stories. Eventually, Morris's lemon bar anecdotes turned into the greatest lesson I needed to learn as a survivor of Hannah's memory. Amy, as long as we carry our loved ones in our hearts, they're truly never gone. 
We may have pictured it, but we'll never know the real suffering your grandma endured. I know you've been through your own painful time, but you've grown to be a survivor, telling your story to all who will listen. People need to know that they're never alone. So cherish your gifts to spread the news. It is how civilization survives. We all learn from it. It's true. <laughs> there is so much to learn from those we've lost. And it's not too late. <laughs> this weight of grief had turned into the gift of impact. And I now carry this whole tapestry of the legacy my grandma left underneath her robe. But now, what do I do with it? <laughs> I rewove Hannah's story and created documentary theater in a play I called Fibers, <laughs> sharing every thread of her story so audiences could take their own lessons from my grandma's story. And the world really needs these stories right now. The news is full of sudden tragedy and life can be taken or changed in an instant. The Parkland shooting, the lives cut short at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. And we know that these deaths are part of a wider, larger tragedy of suffering around the world. Some survivors of the Holocaust and survivors of trauma, they tell their story so it won't happen again. And if they can't or won't, maybe we can and should. My grandmother told my mother she would never teach her daughter a skill that she needed to use to survive sewing. But I carry on this skill in my own way to celebrate the gift that her sewing gave her family, which I do through creating theater and um, my art and, and this quilt. <laughs> You too can carry the lessons that you've lost from someone and, and make the world a better place. That's your and it's our responsibility as survivors. So go ahead and think about someone you've lost whose life you want to carry with you. Learn their story, tell their story, and together we can all move forward reweaving loss into memory that carries on and makes an impact. Thank you.